We would um, like to thank everyone for joining us. It's a great turnout. Um, and um, yeah, we're just really grateful that you've um, opened up your um, Wednesday night to hear us chit chat about knee pain and arthritis. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to give you some really good content and some tangible takeaways um, that you can implement, run it through your um, filter and, um, and see obviously how you can implement some changes to improve your knee pain and possibly your quality of life. Um, so yeah, so obviously we're running live on Facebook as well. Um, and if you do have questions pop up, by all means, put it in the chat box and um, we'll go to there. Uh, but we will have also a question and answer session um, at the end. Um, but we want to make it as interactive as possible so you all can get as much information and um, implementation after this session as well. So, um, and by all means, uh, if you've got follow on questions, um, myself and James and Tracy are always um, available to talk further about um, whatever you have, um, whatever further questions. So, I guess. Um, Without further ado, we should probably introduce ourselves. Um, so for those that don't know me, my name's Amy. I'm a, um, the principal physiotherapist at Perform Physio and Pilates. Um, and um, I'd like to introduce and um, uh, thank James and Tracy for coming along. So we have um, Dr. James Taylor and Dr. Tracy Shang from the Australian Sports Doctors. They've got a clinic in Heidelberg. Um, and, um, and yeah, so what we wanted to do is create a medium where we could chat to people about um, whatever, you know, musculoskeletal or sporting injury they may have. Obviously, in today's climate, um, our accessibility to surgery has reduced and, off, and also accessibility possibly to us in some regards. Some people are socially distancing and self-isolating and not wanting to go out and visit the physio or visit the doctors. Obviously, we've got telehealth um, as well, but um, it's just an extra way that we can get out in the community and um, talk to you all about anything that may be a problem at the moment. Um, so, yeah, so what um, we're obviously talking about is knee arthritis and um, I'm going to shoot it over to... James and Tracy to have a chat about that. So I'm just going to pull up our um, our screen, which, as it would be, of course, um, my uh, I've lost my uh, slides. So what we'll do is James and Tracy, if you just guys want to. We'll do some filler while you resurrect the slides, how's that? Exactly, sounds like a good plan, guys. Good stuff. Go for it, Trace. No worries. Um, so arthritis is um, it's very common. So um, we all know someone who's got arthritis. Oh, we're all developing arthritic symptoms ourselves, I think. Um, and <laughs> unfortunately, um, the Australian National Survey um, in 2018, they... they did, did a survey and, and we know that 9.8% um, of Australians have arthritis um, and knee arthritis is one of the most common um, and unfortunately this number seems to be increasing because um, we are an aging population which is good because we're living longer um, but unfortunately we're also seem to be getting heavier as well so obesity is increasing and um, for this reason the number of people with arthritis is going to go up um, I think the thing with arthritis is that it definitely, um, you know, can be a bit of a burden on our lives. So it, it affects people's mobility and their ability to exercise. Um, but it does a bit more than that. It has economic impacts too, because obviously sometimes it means you, you can't work or, or occasionally you have to retire from a labour job earlier or you have to take some days off where you can't care for people or, or kids. Um, and it also has an has a economic burden on, on, on the healthcare system. Um, so the, at the end stage of arthritis, people need joint replacements, and this is very expensive sort of surgery. 
um, but taking into account, um, you know, the amount of money that people might spend on treatment, um, exercise, appointments, scans, um, it can be quite uh, burdensome. Um, so I guess the point of tonight's webinar is um, we, the message that we want to convey is arthritis is not inevitable, um, even though it is common, um, and there's plenty you can do to sort of manage it um, and slow the progression of the disease as well. So really want to um, put across some positive messages, um, and there's actually a lot you can do for yourself. Um, now I've got our slides back up, we might just start, we've got quite a few different attendees tonight, so people from the community, we've also got some practitioners as well. Um, so just for the interests of um, having everyone on the same page, we might just start with some basic anatomy, which will only be sort of, you know, one minute. So we might just move to the next slide, Amy, if that's okay. Yep. Thank you. And this is just a very basic picture of knees. So the knees um, are one of the largest hinge joints in the body, so it's like a Pac-Man, I guess. Um, in the way it moves. Um, so it's comprised of you know, the, the femur, which is your thigh bone up the top, and then you've got your shin bone, which is the tibia at the bottom. Um, and uh, the patella, which is um, the round sort of bone or the kneecap, sits at front, at the front of the knee. Um, and this is held in place by some tendons. So the quadriceps tendon, so we can see on the left, um, holds, attaches to the top of the kneecap, and then you've got the patella tendon. Um, underneath and that kneecap glides um, in a groove um, and the groove is called the trochlear groove. Um, there are a few ligaments that stabilize the knee so the main ones um, on the sides are called the collaterals and this just stops the knee from um, translating or rocking sideways and then you've got the cruciates um, so we hear a lot about ACL injuries in footy and on the news um, but the cruciate or the cross ligaments um, that are deep inside the middle of the knee um, they just stabilise the knee and try and stop the shin bone from sliding forward and from the knee from rotating as well. Um, so the cartilage is uh, uh, what lines um, the ends of the bone um, and, and basically gives some cushioning and some shock absorption to the joint as it moves. And there's different types of cartilage. You've got the articular cartilage that covers the ends of the bones and then you've got the meniscus um, which is C-shaped or disc-shaped um, cartilage in between the joint as well. Um, James, are you happy to talk a little bit about what, what arthritis is and what some of the symptoms that we commonly might experience? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Trace. Um, arthritis is a condition whereby there's a degenerative change in the quality of the hard hyaline white shiny cartilage that you see in the knee. Uh, at arthroscopy and that you'd see if you're pulling chicken apart. If you pull a chicken apart and you see the white shining glistening cartilage uh, in the joint, uh, that's the uh, shiny articular sort of load bearing cartilage. It does have some sponginess to it, but it's relatively firm. The sponginess there is just to soak up a little bit of the synovial uh, lubricating fluid. Um, that bristle sort of element that's in those joints as well is sort of a, a part of the sort of shock absorber mechanism and I guess that uh, meniscus cartilage, the C-shaped cartilages or kidney bean shaped cartilages that uh, Tracy mentioned before, they're more to do with uh, increasing the surface area of the joint uh, and, and also providing an extra element of sponginess and springiness because that's a little bit more spongy than the uh, hard shiny articular cartilage. So the type of cartilage damage in the knee, there can be two types. There's obviously the soft spongy meniscus that can be torn. But when we talk about arthritis, we're more talking about that hard white hyaline cartilage that can break down, become thinner in the first instance. And there are different grades. One, two, three, and four is one staging system that's used. Without going into the detail of that, certainly as you progress through the grades, you start to get more cracks and fissuring uh, forming in the cartilage. And then eventually you get complete denuding or, or loss of that uh, articular cartilage and you get that bone on bone severe arthritis. But there can be other changes in the joint related to the uh, sort of the viscosity of the lubricant fluid, which can become more watery and more full of inflammatory material rather than that nice lubricant cushioning nutrient sort of fluid that would normally be in a healthy knee. And there can also be bony changes as the bone seems to try and grow around the edges a little bit, forming what's called osteophytes, to try and increase the surface hair of the joint almost, to make up for the poor quality of the joint. Uh, and that can produce an element of clicking, locking and catching as much as sometimes the uh, 
tears in the uh, shock absorber meniscal cartilages and the cracks and fissuring and denuding in the hyaline articular cartilage can. Now, symptoms-wise, as, as it seems from that description, the greater the number of craters or the greater the uh, space that's occupied by the denuded area, the more pain generally is transmitted through, not only from the cartilage loss itself, but more the actual bone starts to get bony swelling and edema in it behind. You can see that on MRI scans, and the bone certainly gets thicker and more sclerotic on x-rays. Uh, the bone pain itself can be uh, quite problematic for some people. The effusion fluid, that sort of inflammatory fluid uh, that replaces the normal synovial fluid, uh, tends to swell the knee up so that the knee becomes more stiff, a bit harder to bend, uh, and to some extent a bit harder to straighten, uh, and particularly uh, difficult for people when they uh, have that, it's almost like a dry, wet phenomenon in the knee where the articular cartilage has lost its ability to soak up the good lubricant fluid, so it's dry, but there's lots of watery, angry fluid in the knee, and that causes the knee to swell so they can't bend it. So they've got this stiff, sore knee. I kind of describe that as being like when you've got uh, dry, irritable eyes and they're watering a lot, but the tear film won't stick to the eye and provide any lubrication and won't moisturise and protect the eye. And that's kind of what it's like inside the knee too. It's like an irritable, itchy red eye. Now, the problem with that is it changes the gait cycle. And so then you start to get more of a limp and antalgic gait pattern forming and you tend to get weakness and pain inhibition coming in. And as Tracy described the anatomy before, the quadriceps muscles, and in particular the vastus medialis obliquus, if that becomes weaker through that pain inhibition, then you start to develop more issues around patella kneecap tracking, and then you get more changes in the biomechanics of the knee joint and, and further pain that can develop from that. You can also then get other issues with uh, hip abduction weakness and perhaps even changes in the way of the ankle and the foot function, all from knee arthritis. So add to that the uh, emotional, psychological elements and the kinesiophobia that can develop with knee arthritis. Then you can have uh, significant issues with regard to mobility and quality of life. As well as ageing, some of the other things that might increase your risk of progressing or developing arthritis is, unfortunately, it seems a little bit more common in, slightly more common in females than males. Um, the other thing is if you've had um, significant joint trauma, so any accidents or injuries to the knee, um, and also if you've um, done a lot of repetitive loading. So we might see arthritis in people who have, um, you know, done a lot of sport earlier in uh, earlier at a younger age, um, or if they're doing um, jobs which require a lot of manual labour or heavy lifting. Um, the other thing that can predispose you to arthritis is um, some family history as well, um, and and also weight. So um, the increased weight um, increases your risk of developing arthritis as well. Um, we're going to hand over to Amy and she's going to have a talk about um, just um, um, some biomechanics and, and looking at breaking that, that pain cycle. Yeah, thanks, thanks Amy. Amy. Thanks, James. Uh, thanks, Tracy. Yeah, so obviously all of the anatomy and understanding what happens from a joint level, it sounds quite problematic and it sounds obviously very painful, which it, it can be. And then that leads to, we know that when you have pain, that's a precursor to withdraw from an activity, which then that compounds our um, disuse. And so, but the problem there lies into moving into this nasty cycle of if you have pain and then you withdraw and, and you have further disuse. And when we have further disuse, then we have further muscle um, atrophy which is like where the muscles get smaller um, and so where we need to come in is to try and um, really kind of reverse that so and the thing that's on our side is that we're really adaptive as um, as the human body is and I've got this lovely little MRI here where um, you can see in the top that is actually a um, 74 year old um, sedentary man and um, 
I've got this little pointer here and you can see here that's the that's the femur bone like that's the really big bone of your thigh um, and that's obviously quite small in this gentleman and then this darker black areas are um, the muscles um, and then all the tissue around that's um, that's adipose tissue fat tissue so you can see that um, this guy's um, muscles aren't doing a great job or they're not very strong because obviously they're not very big. But we can then compare this to the one below where it's a 70 year old triathlete and you can see the differences. We've got a bigger, thicker bone here that's obviously healthier and stronger. And then all of the whole thigh compartment is full of muscle. So the reason why I'm, I'm showing this is that even though like so if you give the stimulus of strengthening and exercise and obviously this guy's on the bike and running and riding um and um swimming his his muscles are adapting to that stimulus whereas at the moment this guy here he's sedentary so he is you know maybe walking to the mailbox and he's um sitting on the couch and going to bed and pottering around the garden um, and so that's where it's our job to try and, um, you know, put in the implementation and the, um, the stimulus to make sure that your legs are looking more like the bottom blokes down here. Um, because as we were talking, the pain cycle is um, where if we've got you know, pain because of arthritis or anything, it, it's the same with any sort of um, problem, is that um, we have pain, we withdraw from the activity, and then um, that in turn will decrease our capacity to um, perform the task at hand. And so then what will happen is that if we've got a mismatch in our body's capacity to perform a task, and the demand of the task being higher, then we're going to have pain and dysfunction. So, you know, that's why physios give you homework all the time and give you exercises is because we're trying to increase your capacity to be higher than the demand of whatever you're asking that to be. And if we're talking about an arthritic knee, it might be that we need to try and increase your capacity so that you can walk up and down stairs without pain. Or you might want to be doing higher level things with some arthritis. Um, and that's where we have to enter in, give the right stimulus and the right exercise, and then just progressively and gently load it up. Um, because otherwise we get into this cycle of, you have pain, we, you withdraw from the activity, so that then you don't have that mismatch of the capacity being higher than your demand. And then our muscles get weaker and then you have more pain because we know that the muscles are protective of the joint. It's like they're the scaffolding, the, the biological scaffolding of the joint. And so if they get smaller, then we have less support and therefore we have more load through the joint and more pain. So that's why we really try and work hard to build up your muscles strength and capacity to do that. And a lot of that is because obviously, um, you know, when you hear about fissuring of um, cartilage and there's lots of terms out there like wear and tear and, um, you know, like they conjure up some really negative um, thoughts in your mind and you think, Oh gosh, I can't maybe like, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing these things because I'm going to cause more damage. But what we know is that if you decrease your muscle bulk and your muscle strength, well, then that's putting more load through the knee joint. And, and that is more provocative than actually doing exercises. So what we need to do is just calm, calm everything down and um, kind of dispel some of those myths around, you know, pain equals damage um, and it's okay like you're in pain anyway it's okay to work through a little bit of discomfort because you've got discomfort anyway what we need to do is work out what exercises we can do that is within comfort or some discomfort 
but know that we're not going to escalate it and know that we're not going to escalate the pain the next day after. So it's just about, you know, really giving that um, reassurance that it's okay to move. It's okay to load the joint um, and all of these things, because if we've got some fear and we've got muscle weakness and we've got joint changes and, you're not sleeping because of the pain and you're a bit anxious, like we're kind of sitting at the, you know, that our cup is right on the, um, right on the brim. And so what we need to do is if we're able to dispel some of those myths and give you some confidence to move and increase your strength, we give you a bigger cup. And so then we, you've got a greater capacity to be able to, um, to do more. Um, so so that's where we're moving towards in, in the conservative physiotherapy space. Um, and so what we do, obviously, is, you know, when someone comes in with a pretty cranky, um, painful knee, the last thing they want to be doing is exercise. So, you know, we've got techniques up our sleeve where we're able to calm pain down, do a little bit of gentle um, hands-on treatment, get you moving, get some confidence and get some wins on the board. And that gives you the confidence that it's okay to move. And, and we might need to withdraw you from activity for a little while. So if, you know, going up and down stairs is provocative, we might need to avoid that for a little while just so that we calm it down because we don't want to go through that pain cycle. So we have to cut that pain cycle down a little bit, increase your confidence with movement. And then once we're calm, then we go through the process of gradually building um, back up. Um, and so we improve your movement pattern and we improve your range. And then we start to gently and progressively load you up. Um, obviously that does not go in a straight line. Um, and sometimes there's ways where we might make really good progress quickly um, and then we might plateau for a little bit and then we might um, or sometimes we just can't get across a swollen cranky knee joint and then that's where we're um, communicating with you know sports docs and um, and we're getting some extra intervention or some extra help from um, from our collective team but generally it's about knowing and trusting the process and and knowing that it's going to take you know, any sort of strengthening work, if you go to the gym, is going to take 12 weeks. So having that time frame in your mind as well, because then that also puts you at ease, knowing that, um, um, you know, each time you're going to get that little bit better. And having that trust in the process, because what we do notice is that when we start this, you'll get improvements in function, but your pain might be about the same. And then it's not until we go to the next level of strength that pain starts to come down. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that, that's kind of the fundamentals of, um, you know, building up your cup in a way. Um, so I kind of touched on it just a little bit about when we hit a roadblock or, when we need to escalate and um, and get um, the docs involved. So I'll pass back over to James and Tracy to chat about the next sections. Thanks, Amy. I think, um, so talking about the cup, we'd, we'd like it to be a mug really, be as big as we can get it. Um, and when we're talking about medical management, um, I mean, when we think of medical management, you think of drugs and, interventions and, and needles and surgery um, but I really just want to re rewind it and, and emphasize that um, the guidelines and the evidence actually all support lifestyle modification so when we talk about lifestyle modification we mean um, exercise um, and weight loss so these are the two things that have the most evidence behind them um, and the GP college has released um, um, guidelines um, on uh, arthritis management for knee arthritis and hip arthritis um, and there's also some clinical um, care standards um, which were updated um, by the Australian guidelines in 2017 and and they're, they're very much on par in terms of the, the message that they're conveying so um, it seems to be land-based and strength 
strengthening um, exercises make the biggest difference um, in terms of um, patients with their pain, um, with their function, um, with their quality of life as well. Um, and when we talk about evidence, um, there's lots of different levels, but we look at um, controlled trials, so trials of people who've been doing exercise compared to people who haven't been doing exercise. Um, and in scientific evidence, we, the, the best kind of trial is something called a, a randomised or a, a blinded trial. Um, but unfortunately, you can't really blind someone from doing exercise. So in the trials that we have, you, you know you're exercising. You can't uh, you know, be given a, a, a fake exercise program, if that makes sense. Um, so, um, but the, the improvements with pain um, across the board seem to be you know, up to, to, sometimes it's 20%, sometimes it's 70%, everybody's different. Um, but we find um, that uh, it takes a bit of time. So um, most people will notice an improvement with their um, program after two to three months. It's not something that you might notice after one or two weeks. Um, so we've got to really encourage people to be diligent and really stick with the program. The other thing the research seems to show is that um, it, people tend to do better if they're um, uh, attending a program that's um, in a facility or, or guided or supervised, um, so with a facilitator, and that could be a physio or an exercise physiologist. Um, and there's lots of theories about why this is, whether it's because the program's more structured, but it's probably actually more to do with accountability and motivation, meaning um, some of us are more motivated than others um, and more determined, you know, than others um, to, to see results. Um, um, but uh, for, for a lot of the part, it's, it's, it's probably a combination of things. Um, weight loss is really important. So um, we, the, the knee is interesting in that if, you, if you're carrying an extra one kilo um, in your body, um, the force or the transmitted force that goes through your knee ends up exponentially being three or four times that amount. Um, so what that means is if you, if you lose five kilos, your knee might feel like you've lost 15 or 20 kilos. It's like you're carrying uh, less of a backpack. Um, so that really um, improves the, the forces going through the joint. Um, so um, some of the other things that we talk about with medical management is um, uh, other uh, th things like using heat. Um, so heat tends to help because inflammation is inflammatory. Um, and there is some evidence that orthotics, so insoles for your shoes, if you've got particularly um, flat feet or feet that need um, optimising their alignment, this can be useful uh, for some people. Um, and um, there is uh, some evidence for braces, but bracing is, uh, it has to be, you know, you have to discuss this with your specialist or your doctor and, and select um, the right type of brace. Um, in general, it's not something we, we recommend just across the board. I think bracing has some evidence for it in those lateral buttress bracing for uh, anterior knee pain with patella tracking issues and so on, but um, not that much evidence in other areas and in fact can weaken a knee and sort of be counterproductive for the strengthening program that a good physio or a physical therapist is trying to institute. And those forces, that three times multiplier is when you're walking. So every step you take, if you're carrying an extra kilo is three, three and a half times that amount. And if you take 10,000 steps in a day, that's 10,000 times three and a bit times the extra weight that you have. So if you have 10 extra kilos, it's hundreds of thousands of kilos momentarily on that knee during the course of the day. And if you jump or run, it's 10 times rather than three times. Um, so you do want to keep the knee mobile. Uh, and braces uh, have a very limited sort of role in terms of uh, very specific conditions. Um, other medical management things is we talk about um, medication. So these are over-the-counter medications and prescription ones. Um, generally speaking, Panadol or Paracetamol is, is the first line choice for, for pain relief. Um, and most people have heard of Panadol osteos. This is a slightly longer acting type of Paracetamol. Um, and generally speaking, it's very safe. So unless you've got um, problems with your liver or, um, or any other known conditions where you can't take Paracetamol, um, most of the time it's, it's fine to start with that. Um, and you can take six tablets a day. 
Um, there is some evidence for using anti-inflammatories, but because they can upset your stomach um, and in older people, they can um, um, cause some trouble with increasing your risk of heart disease or affecting the kidneys. Generally, you want to check with your doctor and you don't really want to be on anti-inflammatories all the time. You might use them for a short period of time for a flare up um, or, or, when you, or when it's absolutely necessary. Um, James and I in particular, but in alignment with um, GP guidelines, we don't like to prescribe lots of stronger pain relief or painkillers unless it's appropriate. So you like to move away from medications that have um, side effects that make you sleepy or, or are addictive like opiates. Um, so opiates are things that are related to, to morphine um, and codeine is the most common one that used to be available over the counter and now it's on prescription only. Um, there are some specialised medications that can be prescribed for nerve pain, um, but these are not standard um, and it's something that you would discuss with your doctor. Um, so that's medications. Um, we can I'll just also... say, Trey, it's just yeah. on the medications. I, I'd sort of dispute that, that it is a common expectation from patients that opiate medication will be a stronger pain relief. Yes. But all of the evidence suggests that it's not stronger for that type of pain. Uh, and you have a dose tolerance relationship. So you need to keep increasing the dose to actually produce the same level of pain relief as time goes on. So it's a, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul with that. Whereas Panadol Osteo is a, is a baseline sort of pain relief just to stop the garden getting too out of control with weeds. And then you come in here and there with your whippersnipper, which is the anti-inflammatories and use that for specific flare ups as they come along uh, is generally the safest way of doing it and putting the opiates in has more complications and side effects than they're worth, generally speaking. Mm. I like your garden analogy, James. <laughs> okay. um, supplements, I like talking about supplements because I think um, it's, a, it's a safer space um, and there's some, there's emerging evidence. So um, the, the disclaimer is that um, the GP college doesn't recommend um, most supplements in general and that's because the evidence is still quite low. Um, having said that, um, generally they're quite safe to try. So when I'm talking about supplements, um, the common ones are fish oil. Um, so fish oil's got omega-3 or some fatty acids in it. And this is something that your body doesn't pr produce. You have to ingest it. So the only way to obtain fatty acids is to, is to basically eat it. Um, it comes in fish. Um, well, fish has got the highest um, source of, of omega-3. Um, and there are different types. There's um, something called EPA um, and then there's DHA. And these are just types of fatty acids. Um, what they do is they reduce inflammation um, in the body and they do this a number of ways. Um, they can reduce the, uh, the amount of white blood cells um, that are produced and attracted to um, sites that have injury. Um, they also affect the cells um, in those particular sites as well. So the cells in the knee, for example, um, so that they're not um, they don't produce as many um, inflammatory cells, but it also means that they don't respond to some of these um, cells and proteins as well. Um, and it affects um, the levels of those proteins and those inflammatory proteins are called cytokines. Um, so these we can see inside the joint fluid because James mentioned earlier that the fluid in the joint, the quality of that fluid changes. Um, so it becomes less viscous um, and it becomes um, more uh, higher concentration of inflammation in there. Um, so you can get um, uh, fatty acids from um, flaxseed oil, you can get it from um, walnuts, but it's uh, highly concentrated in fish. Um, and we think that the dose or the doses that you need is actually quite high. So you need about five or 600 milligrams of omega-3. Um, and that's typically about 2000 milligrams of fish oil. Um, so uh, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, krill or fish or cod, um, it seems to be uh, uh, very similar. Um, and, uh, and higher doses can actually help lower cholesterol. So, so that's fish oil. Um, aside from getting a bit of a fishy burp when, you, when you, you know, you've had your tablets, um, generally they're quite safe. Um, uh, occasionally you might get uh, you know, a bit of nausea or, or something. But, um, uh, the, other, the other supplements um, that are on the market, which um, everybody's heard about, is glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, and glucosamine is something that your body, it's actually in your body, it's, it's a sugar. Um, and so you've got to kind of make sure you don't have really high uncontrolled diabetes before you take this supplement. Um, 
And the research shows that there's actually improvement in pain, but once again, the evidence is quite low. And there has been some uh, research to demonstrate that maybe it might slow down the progression of cartilage. It doesn't help you grow cartilage, so it can't reverse it, um, but perhaps um, it might delay you being able to you know, uh, put off surgery a little bit longer. Um, the dose you need for the glucosamine is 1500 milligrams a day. And there's two different types. There's glucosamine sulfate and there's glucosamine hydrochloride. Um, and the evidence is behind the sulfates. So that's the one that you would buy if you had a choice in, in the store. Um, unfortunately, it does seem to take a bit of time to work. So you'd have to try and take the glucosamine for minimum two to three months before most people notice a difference. Um, chondroitin um, is, uh, is um, a, 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 a sort of a spongy lubricating kind of substance um, that makes up the cartilage. Um, and this is also something that um, is found naturally occurring in, in the body, but um, you can supplement it by taking as a tablet. Um, and that's usually extracted. Um, so it's, they derive it from um, cartilage from, from cows or from sharks. Um, and you need um, 800 milligrams or 1,000 a day, um, perhaps to, to, to help. Once again, the evidence is low. So it's something you definitely could give it a go and then make a decision after three or six months whether you want to continue. Um, is there anything you wanted to add about the supplements, James? And turmeric's the other one. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say turmeric, yeah. I think <laughs> out of those, uh, glucosamine and chondroitin have been the ones that have probably been the ones that have the staying power, they've been around the longest. Um, I've not had a single patient that I know take them that says, I'm so glad I took this, it means that I don't need to have knee surgery. <laughs> I'm so glad I took this, I don't need to come back to see you again. I, I, I haven't seen that. So, and the evidence there, the, the, the quality of evidence was actually pretty poor, I think, in terms of numbers and success rates. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're that great. But again, they're suggested in the literature as something that's it's like PRP and those other treatments that we'll talk about later. If there's not too much harm to it and there's not much benefit, is it worth trying? Mm. And I guess that's where a lot of people fall with the supplements that unless you're allergic to shellfish, uh, for the things that come from shark cartilage, or from some the ones that come from shellfish cartilage, sorry, um, then you're um, probably okay to try it. It's just that it might not work very well. And there's a strong placebo element in a lot of those uh, medications. Correct, yeah. Which I'm not knocking because if that helps people, that's good. <laughs> As long as it gets them moving with the physio, I, like I'm willing to use it if it gets them engaged with the physio. Yeah. My, I think it's nice to have lots of different things up your sleeve. And even if though you know some of these things may not work for most people, um, it's not harmful. Sometimes you add them all together and, and you're, you're better off than where you were before. And, and like Amy said, your cup's bigger. Um, Turmeric's very trendy. So the, the doses for that's 1,000 milligrams a day minimum. Um, but once again, the evidence for that is extraordinarily low. So it's something I'm really happy for my patients to try, but I don't prescribe it as such yet. Yeah. Um, um, James, did you want to have a chat about some of the um, injection options and when they might be suitable? Mm. Yeah, sure. Uh, as you can see from the graphic, the way that's sort of drawn up, uh, education, weight loss uh, and clinical exercise are by far and away the biggest sort of spheres on that page. And surgery, you know, is certainly, I mean, while it's the end stage, is not something to be scared of. In an appropriate case, it's actually the most appropriate thing to do. Uh, and it can be an excellent treatment for knee pain. Uh, but there are this small group who fall between the cracks of all of those. They've tried supplements, they've tried to lose weight and they've either succeeded or not, but they have tried. They're trying with their exercise, but they find it hard to get over a hurdle. And they're not ready psychologically or perhaps physically or financially for surgery. And they want to postpone or delay surgery, uh, or they just want to have better function and they're not considering surgery at this stage. And so then the question becomes, is there something that is not too harmful that has some evidence behind it? And then we get into the tablets that we talked about, the Panadol Osteo and so on. And then we move towards the anti-inflammatories, which have slightly more harm attached to them. And then we start to talk about the injections. Now, the injections have the most significant harm would be a joint infection which in a healthy young person would be somewhere in the order of probably one in a thousand to one in 10,000. I sort of liken that to the one in probably a hundred lifetime risk of dying in a car accident. 
it's a relatively small risk and it is generally considered a safe procedure to have an injection into the knee joint. But for those rare individuals that do get knee joint infections, it, it is a disaster for them. They need to have, generally speaking, uh, surgery to wash out their knee perhaps multiple times and they need to have antibiotics in the drip. So it can be quite confronting for those rare times where it goes wrong. But for the majority of patients, it's actually the needle that we use to inject some of those things is smaller than a blood taking needle. And it's a relatively almost painless injection. It's a tiny prick. So it's a small procedure in some regards, but very small risk of a potentially large consequence. So why would we do it? Well, there's a few different things we can inject into the knee because once you're bypassing the stomach and the liver and you're not having to get medications in that way, or if you've tried putting things topically on the skin, uh, for example, like Nurofen gel, which is a, a big ask for that to get through to a big joint like the knee and have a, have a big impact. Uh, if you bypass all that and you go directly to the knee, you can induce, introduce steroid and local anaesthetic directly into the knee. Now, the local anaesthetic works fairly immediately and can produce pain relief so that someone can stand up and say, gee, it's a little bit stingy just at the spot where you injected, but I can actually walk around without pain a few minutes after the injection. That wears off a few hours later, and then the pain tends to ramp up. Now, that's because there's been an increased volume in the knee and a procedure on the knee, usually with a tiny trace of blood into the knee, uh, which is very irritant inside the knee. That said, if the steroid kicks in, and that can happen anywhere from immediately to a few days later, then the pain can drop back down. And there is reasonable evidence to say that that can last for two to six weeks. Now, while specifically with steroid, there's the risk of perhaps flaring sugars in diabetics, for most patients, they might get a little bit of flushing in the face or some sweats, but there's not that many side effects. And in fact, if they have a, as I often say, if you have a dance and you want to go, or a wedding you want to go to in a week or two's time, a steroid injection in an arthritic knee will get you up dancing on the table for a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, and also, more importantly, gives the physios a window and the osteos a window to get in and prescribe exercise and to do the soft tissue work that you're perhaps tender and, and frightened to do um, as a patient, and also to start that process to get through your mind that you can move that knee without pain. It is possible. And that little bit of hope is a very, very good, strong thing that, that, that can actually help carry you through as the steroid wears off. The lubricant in the knee starts to spread around a little bit more evenly. That dry cartilage starts to regain some of its sponginess the knee mechanics, the biomechanics start to fix themselves as you start to progress through that. So for the relatively uncommon risk of infection, uh, you can actually potentially get quite a lot of benefit out of a steroid injection. The main downfall is it only lasts for a potentially short amount of time. So I would tell patients that probably 70 or 80% of patients would notice some kind of improvement from a steroid injection in the knee, at least some kind. Uh, quite a few of those will have a really dramatic improvement in their knee pain, but they're probably going to experience that for about a month. Then patients say, I don't like the sound of that. I want something that lasts longer. And I, and I would like something that lasts longer too as a clinician. So then you start looking towards things like the synthetic joint lubricants. Now, one example of that is Synvisc or hyaluronic acid or hyaluron. Uh, that's a naturally occurring substance in the knee joint lubricant. It's also in a lot of face creams. Uh, it happens to be in the case of Synvisc, uh, derived from uh, rooster goats. So some people, it freaks them out to think they've got rooster goo um, floating around in their knee, but it really is just the source that they extract that chemical from, and that chemical is a naturally occurring chemical in the knee, and it's just a lubricant. So injecting that in there makes no difference to the quality of your cartilage in the direct sense, but indirectly by providing lubricant to the knee, some of those inflammatory chemicals start to die back down a little bit because they're not rubbing so hard on those dry bits of cartilage anymore. It's not stimulating more of that angry fluid. And the next thing that happens, we think, is that the cells that were making the natural lubricant that were being whipped and flogged, well, now they've had a little bit of a holiday, perhaps uh, for a few weeks to a month or two, and then that lubricant breaks down but the effects in those that it work in can actually last sometimes for six or more months sometimes. Uh, so we think that the body perhaps takes over that role of making its own lubrication again, 
a little bit more effectively once it's had a little bit of a holiday. So I tell people that most of the studies that are done on hyaluron seem to suggest that there'll be about a 60 to 70% uh, response rate of some kind. Now that's not necessarily a dramatically good response, but some kind of response where they say, I think I noticed it did something positive for my knee. That means there's about a third that say it did nothing for their knee. And again, that small tiny group who are unhappy because they had a bad outcome. And so people say, well, that seems at least reasonable. It looks like it might get me a two thirds chance at having six months of uh, symptom improvement. And of that group, perhaps one third will have a quite a good level of symptom improvement. Things that I'm not so thrilled about with uh, Dulane and Simvisc and those hyaluron acid ones is you do get uh, some people who swell up in the first couple of weeks after the injection. So their knee gets a bit puffy and sore. You get patients who don't like the idea of having a foreign material that's come from a laboratory injected into them. Uh, you have occasionally, rarely, people who are allergic to chicken feathers and eggs, and uh, depending on the degree of their allergy, might not be suitable for something that's uh, derived from uh, chicken, such as uh, from rooster combs, such as uh, Simbisk. But generally speaking, one to two thirds of patients with some sort of outcome that they're happy with, and one third that are not for six months, maybe. Then people say, is there anything that's better than that? And I'll say, well, it's not anything's better, but there is something different. Uh, you can look at PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. Uh, that is taken from a blood test. You take, you extract blood from, say, the arm. You put it into a specialised syringe and into a centrifuge and you spin the blood. And what you do is you can compact down the red blood cells to the bottom of the tube and then you're left with this straw colored fluid on top, which has a preponderance of platelets. And I think when you think about when you've cut yourself and you've got a little scab on your hand and you kind of, everyone gets itchy and they flick that little scab up and they see that little yellow serum underneath. It's kind of like that. It's that straw colored fluid that has a preponderance of healing properties uh, and also some uh, anti-inflammatory properties to stop the wound uh, becoming too irritable because the platelets are the things that rush in when you first cut yourself and help to clot off that wound and they release those chemicals. So we're really trying to get from the plasma, the platelets with their growth factors and anti-inflammatory factors, and we then inject those into the knee. So the same techniques are involved for all of them except Simvisc and Duralane are a bit thicker, more viscous, whereas uh, PRP or platelet-rich plasma or autologous conditioned plasma, a number of different names that uh, people use for it, is a bit thinner, a bit runnier. It does provide some initial lubricant effect, uh, the same as Synvis does, but the main mode of action that they believe seems to be from a complex pathway of anti-inflammatory activity. Uh, so mainly it's considered, uh, if anything, an anti-inflammatory shot. There is a lot of controversy around whether PRP actually works. Uh, we resisted uh, using that as a modality for when we first started practicing because we weren't satisfied with some of the evidence, but there is some evidence that's out there now for leukocyte negative PRP in knee injections, uh, having some sort of benefit in up to two thirds of patients, so similar to the Synvisc, but potentially, if you're lucky, the data does push out to one to two years. Now, these are very small studies. Uh, the reason these studies are small is that something like Synvisc is patentable, so you can make money off it, and so you're willing to pay money as a drug company to have big trials. But if you're doing something like PRP, it comes from your own blood. Uh, the only people who are gonna do trials are people who are doing master's degrees and PhDs, and they just want a trial with 10 people or 15 people just to prove their little point. And then usually the finding is either, we couldn't demonstrate a benefit, but there wasn't a harm, or, we think we demonstrated a benefit, but further studies are needed to confirm this. So then they do these big meta-analyses and they try and pull these different studies together and see if we pull them all together, we might have a thousand people, we might have a hundred people at least, can we see if there's a benefit? And some of those meta-analyses have done exactly the same thing. So depending on how they select for the studies, it either shows we're not sure, or it says we think there's a benefit. And the problems are that there's different types of PRP some of them have more white cells in them than others, which are the things that fight infection. You'd think that would be a good thing, but in the knee that probably in increases the amount of sting that goes into the injection uh, period, post-injection period. 
Uh, that said, it's mainly an anti-inflammatory shot. Two thirds of patients that anecdotally that I see and that uh, some of the key studies we've looked at have shown will get some sort of benefit and potentially data out to one to two years that they will get a benefit. The catch, it's more expensive of an injection process. So steroid injections probably only cost the fee to inject it. The actual steroid is relatively cheap. Uh, so different places under ultrasound guidance will probably charge around about $100 to inject that. It's roughly similar to what we'd probably charge in our clinic, uh, just by landmark guided injection. Whereas if you're going to do a Synvisc type injection, just to buy that from the chemist, I think you've got to pay about $600 to buy it. Uh, it used to be about $480 a year or so ago, and then the government said you had to have a script for it, and the pharmacist tagged their, uh, their markup on it, so it's skyrocketed up to $600. If you allow, say, $100 for that to be injected, then that becomes a $700 injection ballpark figure. PRP, generally speaking, around town, the cheapest places will be doing it for close to $300. Um, that's because the collection kits and the centrifuge are quite expensive. Centrifuges can be anywhere up to ten plus thousand dollars, and the collection kits uh, can be a hundred plus dollars each. So uh, by the time they add all the consumables together, that would probably take up at least half of the cost of the PRP. So I think. Um, PRP is a more expensive process because it also has to be done three times. Now, I say it has to be done three times. Uh, one PRP can sometimes reduce knee pain, but it might not have a particularly lasting result. And two injections shores that up to some degree. Three injections uh, is the process that we use because that was the study that was done based on the collection kits and centrifuge that we use. Uh, and we follow exactly the same cookbook formula that Arthrex, the big surgical supplier who gave it to us, used in their studies. And we said, well, if it worked for you guys, we're just going to copy it. <laughs> so there's not a whole lot of science behind exactly how to space out the injections and when to do them. Uh, most of the studies seem to do them about a week or two apart if they're going to do them. Um, we do one injection a week apart times three. So three weeks course is finished. Um, it's for people who don't want to have a foreign material injected into them. They like the idea that it's come from their own body. They accept that there is a controversy in the evidence base and there is the potential to do some harm with that injection, but it is probably considered a safe technique because it is the same technique effectively as injecting a steroid or synthesis. Uh, and that they want something that has the potential on some studies to last longer than Synvisc, or perhaps they've tried Synvisc before and it didn't work. So it's a reasonable extra modality in there, uh, and it's something that uh, a minority of patients it would be suitable for, but there are certainly patients who have had that who are super happy. It can also just, uh, for the sake of completeness, be injected into certain tendons, and there's varying degrees of evidence depending on which tendons. Some have no evidence uh, and some have some, ev some evidence for benefit. The lucky last type of injection is uh, stem cells. Now, stem cells are about $10,000 plus potentially for a knee in Melbourne. Uh, it's very expensive. Uh, it has no greater evidence at this stage than PRP. So it's automatically something that's out of uh, consideration for most patients. Do you got anything to add about that one, Trace? No, I'm very. Um, I I think with PRP, um, I don't have. We haven't had many patients who have felt that they've had no benefit from it whatsoever. So, having said that, it seems to work better in people who've got moderate arthritis and mild to moderate. Um, obviously, by the time you've got very severe arthritis, so grade four. Um, um, uh, Synvisc and PRP are less likely to work. Um, but having said that, if you have got grade four arthritis, you might be a good candidate for surgery, um, which I think we will discuss next. Mm. Yeah. Well, surgery is obviously, uh, like I said, it's something that people want to try and put off. And there's two groups I see that come in that talk to me about surgery. And the first group are those that come in and say, I have had some pain in my knee for three weeks. I think I need to have a knee replacement. 
and they walk in and they look, they're smiling at me and, and I say, I'm not sure that you do, but let's, let's run through this and let's work out what, what your logic is and why you think that. And then there's the other group who come in and say, oh my God, I don't want to have knee surgery and I'm begging them to have knee surgery because I know how much better their life's going to be. They're putting it off for too long and they're starting to lose function and they're starting to get problems with their hips and they're starting to get problems with their back and their quality of life has deteriorated. They're missing out on things in life that they could enjoy if they had successful surgery. Now, knee surgery, uh, there's different types of surgery on the knee. Obviously, there's the telescope type surgery and that is not what we're talking about here. That's more for where there's little tears in uh, the cartilage that they're going into either trim back or fix. And in the early stages of arthritis, sometimes it will be appropriate to have arthroscopic surgery to trim back uh, loose bits of cartilage that are actually, or, or, or floppy bits of cartilage that are catching and causing mechanical clicking feelings in the knee that feel uncomfortable for people. But it is not something that, certainly not something that prevents arthritis. If anything, it possibly accelerates it. Uh, and so it's not done with a view to improving symptoms of knee pain. It's more just if you've got those mechanical symptoms. But when someone gets to the stage of needing surgery for their knee arthritis, generally speaking, they're talking about knee replacement surgery. Now, there are two main different streams of knee replacement surgery. There are partial knee replacements or hemi knee replacements, which means half of the joint. They are suitable in a minority of patients who have single compartment uh, knee arthritis. So for example, if they only have arthritis on the inner aspect of the knee and not the outer aspect of the knee, and not behind the kneecap, because they're the three main compartments. If they've only got it in one, then they might be suitable to have that half replaced. The satisfaction surveys from patients for that tend to rate it above 80%, and it helps to, uh, you can preserve the uh, anterior cruciate ligament during that surgery. Uh, that has the advantage that the knee, not only is it a hinge joint that moves backwards and forwards, but it has some rotational component to it as well. And so it produces a more natural feeling knee afterwards. A little bit more technically difficult, but it does preserve some options for later too. Uh, of course, you need an intact anterior cruciate ligament to have that surgery. Total knee replacement though is probably the more common operation because most people who have arthritis in one compartment of their knee have it across two to three compartments of the knee, or they have damage to their ACL, which is possibly one of the reasons why they've developed arthritis in the first place. So those patients uh, will have both the end of the femur and the end of the tibia reshaped. So you remove the majority or all of that articular cartilage and you resurface that with metal bearing surfaces and then a plastic insert, a filler insert, and you get this sort of cushioned plastic lubricant effect uh, from that. Um, the kneecap is done in some patients but not not the majority of patients. Uh, so generally speaking, that can be, uh, they can remove the innovation around that without having to replace that, but it's mainly the uh, femoral and the tibial compartment components that are, uh, that are responsible for that reduction in pain. It can be quite tricky to balance the knee up and get the tension right on the inner and as outer aspects of the knee. And there are all sorts of now robotic surgery assistant devices to try and use that. Some are wholly robotic, some are partially robotic and overridden. They still haven't proven that it actually improves the outcome of the surgery. But it is a great data collection tool and it does help to get knees within a certain tolerance that perhaps is not always possible just uh, by eye. Hopefully one day that will lead to further advances that improve the satisfaction ratings for total knee replacements because I think probably about 80% of patients who have a total knee replacement are quite happy with it. Whereas there's still a group that sort of feel that they're lacking something that they wish that their surgery had, had, had added something else to their life as well. Um, hip replacement surgery on the other hand, almost everybody's happy with. So there's still a way to go with regard to knee uh, replacement surgery in terms of patient satisfaction. Do you have anything to add about that Trace? No, other than traditionally for knees, we try to hold off doing a knee replacement traditionally as long as we can. Um, the reason being for that is that um, knee replacements uh, obviously in themselves can, can need replacing over time. Yeah. Um, either the bone around it um, or the, the, the actual, um, you know, 
um, replacement itself um, wears out, um, so to speak, um, which is why we try to put off um, having a total knee replacement until you're 50, 55, 60, 65, if we can help it. Um, yeah, I think that uh, it's certainly true that a hip replacement can last 40 years. Um, plus potentially the newer prostheses, they still don't know because they've just put them in in the last 10 years and they don't, they don't know how long they're going to last, but they, they keep getting better every 10 years. They find that they, the, the prosthesis from 10, 20, 30 years ago are getting better and better. Uh, knee replacements in a young overweight patient, say in their 40s, uh, who's 30, 40 kilos overweight, they're probably going to wear that out if they're active. They're going to wear that out within potentially 10 years. So they're the ones that sometimes we target for that PRP just to try and buy them even six or 12 months, because that's six or 12 months at the start. If, they, if the PRP works, and that's the big question, if it works, that might translate to three, four, five years at the end after their replacement that they, before they have to revisit it. If you can just postpone it an extra 12 months, they'll be that much less active in 10, 20 years time that they won't wear it out as fast at that end of their knee replacement, if, if that makes sense to everybody. And so we definitely tried to slow those ones down, but again, not at the expense of their gait pattern and the strength in their muscles. If they've been trying all of these other things with the physiotherapist, they've been trying all of their analgesics and they're not winning, then there's no shame in, and there's no harm, sorry, no, no shame in saying, I need surgery to get the mechanics in my knee restored so that I can preserve the rest of my chain. And if that means a revision has to happen, that's, that's what has to happen. But it's certainly um, the patients that we generally see for knee replacement, they're 60 years old. They're generally very happy with the result of their surgery. And most of them would comment to me afterwards, I wish I hadn't waited this long. I'm glad that they did, but, but they wish they hadn't. So that's, that's probably very true, Trace. We do try and put them off, but there's a certain point where it's appropriate to just go ahead. Definitely. And I think that people then ask, when is that point? And I think that that's, uh, it's not a decision that necessarily a patient should make in isolation and it's not a decision that their surgeon or their physio or their sports doctor should make for them. It's, it's a teamwork approach to that. You need the input from the physios to know if they've actually optimised. You need the input from the patient to tell you how they're coping. You need to know how they're sleeping. You need to know the impact of it on their life. And you need the input from the surgeon to know what's technically possible with the prosthesis and with their knee anatomy and what sort of they can, what sort of outcome they might expect, what range of outcomes. So generally speaking, if someone is not sleeping at night, they've got a lot of rest pain, it's affecting their gait pattern and they have a loss of enjoyment in life or loss of activities. And it's not correcting with the uh, clinical exercise, education, weight loss attempts, uh, they've had their biomechanics looked at everything from podiatry to uh, their knee alignment and just if they've considered whether they've tried the oral medications plus or minus the injection options, then it's time. Absolutely. But just because you have knee arthritis does not mean you need to have a knee operation. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is actually the minority of patients that need to have that done. Um, James, we've just had a um, question through the chat box. Yeah, I spotted that about PRP. Yeah, just can you go over the cadence of that? For yeah, us? generally speaking, uh, there's different systems for doing PRP. So if you've made the decision that it's appropriate for you as a patient, uh, it's one injection, generally speaking, weekly for three weeks with a leukocyte negative uh, PRP. There are some uh, systems out there and some leukocyte positive systems I know that will do perhaps two injections or one injection. They generally charge more <laughs> for those injections uh, per injection. I think, um, is it right, Tracy? Melbourne Radiology does a two shot system. Yes, correct. And Olympic, I Park, think Olympic is Park is three. three. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and we use a three shot system. Now, how often does that get repeated? Well, if that works, and if they're lucky and they get one or two years out of that, you don't need to repeat it during that time frame. You wait until they're symptomatic again. The big question then comes, what happens at the end of that time? If someone's had it two years ago and it's starting to wear off, should they just have one dose as a top-up 
should they repeat the cycle of three? And we haven't yet found a study that proves to us what actually the correct thing to do is. So we're sort of left with common sense, common medical sense about what to do there. It would be reasonable to do a course of three again, but for financial reasons, it would be not unreasonable to do one or two and see how they go. But generally mm -hmm. speaking, you'd be looking at starting the course again. Uh, do you, is there any benefit in having top-ups regularly so you don't dip? No, I don't think that's prudent. I think you wait till you get symptoms. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your uh, question, Graham. Feel free to post another question up if I missed the, missed the mark. Cool. All right. So, just, yeah, so we've already talked over the surgical. So, yeah, so obviously we've talked about um, arthritis being a, um, you know, a continuum. So, obviously, there's mild, moderate, and severe, and then there's different um, interventions at each and every level. And obviously, if you're moving down that surgical pathway, which is completely um, natural and a, a good option at that time, because often uh, James and I were talking that we try and talk people out of it and then all of a sudden we flip and we go, all right, well, let's go have surgery. And we've kind of in, um, put in more fear and apprehension um, so it's definitely, it's got its place and it has good outcomes and it improves function and it improves pain when you're at that point. But we also want to get you as strong as possible before surgery because we know that the stronger you are going into it, then your better recovery um, and your quicker recovery is going to be because you're going to have more you know, muscle bulk, which will be that scaffolding of the knee. Um, and so that's where, you know, when we get hit with some arthritis and it's really acutely sore and it's swollen, you kind of go, how on earth am I going to get this knee to quieten down and not be so sore? And that's where, like, we can use different tools. Like, we've obviously talked about a lot of different modalities here and it isn't one size fits all by any stretch of the imagination and sometimes it's bringing in a few different um, strategies along the way and getting the input of your trusted medical advisors but definitely you know working out you know you've got a sore knee but what else within that chain isn't sore and we can build up that and build up your capacity and kind of sneak up behind the knee and build it up strong. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with, yeah, your glutes and your hip muscles or your calf muscles. And often by getting some load coming through then, it, through those muscles, then we're able to get a little bit of capacity up. Like, and they're good shock absorbers of the, um, of the whole leg when you're taking step by step. So then we're able to go from there. So strategies are around building up other muscles. Obviously, weight loss is a massive strategy. Having really good education, that's a really massive thing to have within your toolbox of um, strategies on how to manage your knee pain. And then we can go, well, what is your threshold? And let's work below that for a little while and gently build it up. So, you know, if you're having trouble doing um, standing up off your couch because it's quite low, well, let's train you hopping up from your dining chair, which is a little bit higher. Or if you're still getting pain from that, well, let's try the bar stool. And then you can get strong with that height and that range, build up your muscle bulk, and then... Um, and then you can go down to your dining chair and then you can go down to your couch and, and build up those strategies. So it's about kind of identifying where your level is and kind of entering just maybe a touch below it so that we don't flare things up. And then just gradually, like brick by brick, just building upon that and obviously, um, you know, monitoring your weight and monitoring your activity. A lot of the times... And again, knowing that it's like we talk about it as a continuum, but it, it is not a straight line because 
as your function improves, it means that then you do more. Mm -hmm. So you will um, feel a little bit better. So then spend a weekend in the garden and then call us up on Monday saying my knee is really sore. And like, but you know, sometimes I'll go, well, you know what, that's a good thing because three weeks ago you would have never have contemplated getting out in the garden. But it's understanding that you will have setbacks. Um, the knee will go um, a bit hot for a while, but then, you know, we know how to calm things down. And so in terms of from a biomechanical perspective, like I talked about, like focusing on glutes. So, you know, we know that, you know, from a biomechanical standpoint, if you're weak through the outside part of your glutes, your knee is more likely to rotate inwards. Um, and the same from if um, you're really, really flat footed, you're going to have more of that um, internal collapse through the knee, which will load the knee joint that little bit more. So can we get you strong through the outer glutes to compensate and to rotate that knee outwards to offload that joint? And then that's a strategy that we don't even have to move the knee to be able to get the glutes firing up and, and getting that working a little bit better. You know? And then the other thing is that we talk about physio or conservative management. Sometimes we hit a bit of a threshold because you know, we just give sit to stands or we give TheraBand exercises. And when you think about life, um, we need, and if you think about going back to what James was talking about, the amount of load that goes through the knee, we actually have to put a fair bit of load in through, like get you up to the level to accepting and getting the tissue to tolerate a fair bit of load because as soon as you go upstairs or downstairs, then that's more load um, through the knee. If you're going to pick up a grandchild that's 20 kilos, well then us physios, we have to get you being able to squat 20 kilos. And it's highly possible, like I've got, lots of patients where you know they've come not being able to go upstairs anymore but now they're able to squat 80 kilos and you might think that that is a bit crazy but if you just do it step by step you make um remarkable gains when all of the ducks are in a row and um and yeah and we find that then each little step, you get that little bit more motivated, that little bit more um, relaxed and, and not so movement phobic. Um, and, um, and yeah, so I think having that understanding that it's okay to strengthen and it's okay to work in a little bit of discomfort as long as you're not spiking with pain, then that's okay. And that also pain doesn't mean that you're damaging the knee further as well. So that's another really important piece of um, education to have in the back of your head as well. Um, so Amy, yeah. can I ask you a leading question? Go for it. What percentage of patients that come in with a really sore knee have really weak hip abductors and external rotators in the glutes? From you, in your experience because I know mine is high so I'm just <laughs> yes um, I probably couldn't think of one that doesn't yeah yeah definitely it's a big um, a big rock in the jar for sure um, and also um, hip extensor muscles I think we tend to you know glute max we sit a lot all day and we don't necessarily extend our hip much. Um, and so, you know, our glute max muscle is one of the biggest, mu well, that big yeah, one of the biggest muscles in the body and a really good shock absorber for ground reaction forces. Mm. Um, so, yeah, strengthening up all the hip musculature is huge and yeah, you can definitely, like, yeah, there's not one that I wouldn't do some um, um, external rotation and abduction work with, that's for sure. Yeah, because I get some patients that come in and what they've had from their physical therapist is uh, a series of stretches. Yeah. 
yeah. they've had soft tissue work done, massage, maybe dry needling. Yeah. And they've maybe had one or two exercise, what I would term active exercises. Yeah. And I think this was something we discussed off camera is the bugbear of both of ours is that there's just not enough, uh, they're not hitting enough muscle groups and they're not yeah. certainly not progressing them to the point where there's enough load. And it does take time and some knowledge and some skill of, of getting them to that point. But, you know, there's, there's I shouldn't say there's failed rehab, but there, mm. all, all rehab is good because at the worst case scenario, it's some sort of prehab. But, but it's, there's, there's rehabilitation that seems to be very much soft tissue focused and making people feel good at the time they're having the treatment. Yeah. But not necessary, and I know that that's an important modality. I'm actually in favour of hands-on treatment, but um, if anything, it gets patients' confidence up and it helps to sort of ease them into the active treatments. But the active treatments seem to be um, underloaded. Yeah, it, definitely not enough. Um, so definitely hands-on treatment has a short term window of benefit and that's been proven time and time again within the research. And like I'm a manual therapist, I use it and I use it every single day. But what it gives us is the window to calm things down so that then we can match it with the right exercises to build back up. And if you're not matching it with the right exercises, all you're doing is giving symptom relief and it's kind of like trying to pump up a punctured tire. Like you'll pump it up for a bit, but then it'll just deflate over time. Unless you start addressing some of the key causative factors. And the key causative factors are deconditioning and weakness. And we know that the only way you're going to improve is to actually give the stimulus of increasing the strength and, you know, I think a lot of the time we get stuck with going, you know, well, you know, we're trying to do a little bit of exercise and we might give some reps of 12 or 15. And that's good to, for the beginning to try and get movement happening, get understanding and calmness of the movement. But again, that's not enough. That's not building strength. We need to be doing you know, five reps at relatively heavy load. But you can't go straight into that either because you've got someone with a, a sore, cranky joint. I can't give them a bit of a release and then go, all right, let's go into the gym and we're going to do five squats and here's, you know, 50 kilos. Um, that person um, would get very angry with me very quickly and have a very sore knee. Well, I guess that that's where, I mean, people ask us, why would you send somebody to a sports doctor? Well, like, what would be the point in that? Yeah. And I guess it's if the practitioners that send them to us, I guess they're saying, well, they've got a patient who they've tried their manual therapy on and they're trying to progress them through exercise, but they're hitting a sticking point. Yeah. So sometimes they'll use us as just an alternate modality, not, not different, but well, it's just a, a, an additional element that you can add on to see if you can get past a sticking point. Yeah. But generally speaking, it's just to reiterate to patients that they're on the right track because they get frustrated yeah. with, that, with the yo-yo, which is normal because, it, I mean, I would get frustrated in that position. Mm. Um, and so some of the practitioners we work in with, we're literally just reinforcing that, yes, you are on the right path. Yes, this will hurt sometimes. Yes, you need to push past that. Yes, you've got a good physio. So I think that that's sometimes we, Trace and I probably just feel like we're a, a, a bit of a broken record parroting to patients what the physios have already told them. <laughs> well, and everyone needs a bit of reassurance for sure. So it is important to have that, you know, second pair of eyes, third set of eyes to go, yep, you're on the right path. We don't need to escalate. We don't need to image. Yep, we're going okay. Mm. So... Absolutely. That's, that's probably actually another good question too, Amy, is that um, when do you image people with knee arthritis? I might let Tracy take that one. if Because, uh, I mean, oh, but Amy, when do you image? Because I know physios do often organise imaging. Uh, some, some do it more than others, but uh, when do you organise imaging for knee arthritis or if you suspect that as the differential? I image when I think that my treatment might need to change. 
or with a red flag. If And so a red flag is where I think that something more sinister might be going on. Um, but if I think that it's generally not me imaging, it's me saying you need to go um, have a chat with your doctor and then me getting on the phone. So by that you mean you're concerned about tumour or some other significant missed yeah. fracture event or something? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then in terms of, yeah, I image if I think that we need to change treatment. Like I know that... Um, so physios can refer for x-rays and MRIs, um, but um, depending on what we're imaging and what the cost is. But, yeah, generally, if I think that there's a fracture, um, I'll image, and if I think that there's really significant arthritis, I'll image with an X-ray. If... I'm not in already in consultation with you guys. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the next tricky question. I'll, I'll, I'll flick it, Trace. <laughs> is when, like, why would you X-ray someone with knee arthritis? What's the point? And why would you MRI somebody with knee arthritis? What's What's the point? What management does it change? Yeah. So the point of imaging um, in in medicine is generally we don't image things just to have a look. So we use imaging as a, as a it's adding extra information to something we're already suspecting, or if you want to exclude something. So most of the time you make the the diagnosis for arthritis um, just by talking to someone and examining them. Um, you might do the imaging, you might do some x-rays of someone's knee to, 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 to look at the severity of the arthritis, whether it's, you know, moderate, or, uh, mild to moderate versus moderate to severe. Um, but keeping that in mind, it's probably not going to change the, the management. Um, the, the MRI is a very good tool. So x-ray is very good at, at, at uh, obviously having a look at the joint space um, and, and excluding really obvious fractures. Um, but it's not good at looking at soft tissue. So if we're thinking of, that you've got a, a ligament sprain or a soft tissue injury, um, then, then x-ray is not going to be very helpful. Um, you, you mentioned red flags earlier. So red flags is, is something that uh, practitioners use this, this term, but it's basically we want to make sure we're not missing really important things. And the typical red flag is, is a tumour or malignancy. So this is pain that's progressively just gotten a lot worse, particularly at night time, or just seems really disproportionate um, to, to what you're finding on examination. Um, so, um, or if there's been a trauma of some kind, so someone's fall and, and, and hurt themselves and it's just been not quite right since then, you just wouldn't want to miss um, a fracture. Um, MRI gives us really excellent detail about uh, with in terms of bone and soft tissue as well. And you can actually see, and you can see the meniscus, you can see the ACL, the PCL, you can see structures on MRI that you can't see on X-ray. Um, so occasionally you might, you might use this if your knee's locked. So uh, with arthritis, obviously you might have pain, swelling, stiffness, um, some, you get grinding noises, um, um, clicking, but if it's actually locked, so you're actually stuck, like you can't fully straighten your knee um, um, or you can't really bend it um, very far, then occasionally you might actually have a bit of meniscus, a bit of cartilage that's just fl flapped back on itself or stuck on itself. And James mentioned earlier about this mechanical locking, so it's actually structurally locked um, as opposed to it's pain that's stopping you. It's actually... Uh, mechanically locked right? like the lego lego pieces are sort of you know stuck together um, so in that case um, doing an mri might be very useful to have a look at that um, and in in those circumstances sometimes a keyhole surgery arthroscopy might be useful just to shave that little bit of cartilage back once again that doesn't fix the arthritis but it might just release your knee and actually let you move through that range of movement um, so that's that's when I would use um, imaging, but um, I do find a lot of patients come in and they seem sometimes they're surprised um, that you know we uh, James and I don't always ask for an MRI um, for, for arthritis of the knee, um, and that's because it wouldn't change. Meaning we're going to get you moving, going to get your pain levels down, get build up your confidence, get you stronger, um, get your everything aligned in terms of how you move with your back and your hip and your knee and, and your feet, um, and and. Um, work together to set some different goals. So we want to make sure, that, you know, sometimes your goal might be I want to have no pain and we've got to sit down and say, look, that actually might be, you know, a little bit unrealistic in the short term. We might actually have to look at some different goals. Okay, what do you need to be able to do? Let's see if we can get you back to doing some of those things. Because um, some people's goals are I want to be like I was when I was, you know, 
25 years of age and, and I have to sit down and say, look, um, we're going to have to change the, the goalposts here. But, but I do agree with you. I want your pain levels down. I want you stronger, moving better as well. So, so in terms of imaging, I guess there's that, uh, the go I mean, I tend to diagnose and treat more based on that goal setting and, and what examination and history gives me. Um, X-ray, like Amy, I would do if, there's, if I'm looking for red flags or pre-surgical staging. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you don't necessarily need to do it to confirm the diagnosis. Some patients, it's required for their mindset to do it. I understand that. And so sometimes it can be useful then. But I, I don't need it for my mindset unless there's a red flag. And MRI, probably only if there's locking or I'm suspicious of some soft tissue issue that might be uh, amenable to a surgical intervention. Otherwise, I should be able to diagnose most of those things clinically, I would have thought. And so a lot of people sort of get quite bound up, patients, I mean, they get quite bound up in the idea that they need x-rays or MRI scans, but it's actually the minority of people that need it unless they're planning surgery. Okay. And surgery, then it's for working out angles and things. It's not really just to look at how bad it is. You can actually have quite symptomatic knee arthritis that radiologically only looks like a moderate and you can have quite severe looking knee arthritis on an x-ray that somebody's still walking up and down the stairs fine. Mm. And it's, you know, it's not always a direct correlation. It's tricky. Sure. Good stuff. So I think we might just um, hand it over to anyone that may have any further questions. Um, so by all means, type it into your your chat at chat box and we can answer away um and um yeah so and then other than that if people want to um chat um type away obviously um we've covered a lot of content tonight um but it's all been extremely um broad so if um anyone has any questions about um, their own personal um, condition, um, by all means, send us a message um, by our emails and um, we can organise a time to, to have a chat and to be a little bit more specific to um, individuals. Um, I think we're all doing the joy of telehealth at the moment in addition to the uh, in-clinic consultation. So if anyone's worried about COVID, you're very welcome to uh, contact us and we'll do the video link up. Absolutely, <laughs> definitely. And for things like knee OA, um, you know, telehealth works perfectly well. Mm -hmm. So that's good. It's All surprising right. how much you can get out of uh, history over telehealth. Uh, examination is a little bit limited, but you can get some idea from uh, telehealth on that too. And then that way, if you do need to come into the clinic to see uh, Amy or to see us, it minimises the amount of time you have to be in the clinic with other patients and uh, so on. Yeah. So it can be quite useful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, um, definitely. It's pretty... Um, interesting doing telehealth and doing um assessments and um looking for knee um movements or shoulder movements but yeah definitely we get the most from obviously um asking the question and then correlating to whatever um range or test we want to do mm -hmm. yeah that's good all right it looks like um we're pretty much sorted i think a few people have just saying um that it's all good and thank you and um yeah that's all um all fantastic so by all means take our emails down get in touch if you have any questions um but really we're just really grateful that you um gave up your wednesday night and um and yeah didn't watch master chef and watched us instead um Probably not quite as... Well, watched us make a meal of it. There you go. Oh. Good work, James. Oh, yeah, exactly. Tracy will kick me for that later. <laughs> gotta bring, we've got to bring more spice next time. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Now the, now the dad jokes are coming out. Oh, that's a perfect time to wind up and yeah, um, it is. finish, I reckon. So, all right. So, thank you, everyone. So, I will... Um, Stop on Facebook and we'll um, we'll end the session. So thank you very much. Thank you, Amy.
Thank you, Amy. Thanks, guys. We'll catch Bye. up. Bye.